Hi everybody, this is Howard from Florida Learn to Fly. Today we're going to cover the local legend number 12 for MSFS, the Dornier DOX. Just a quick disclaimer here. These lessons are for use in a flight simulator of any brand for the purpose of understanding real techniques that pilots learn during flight lessons. And I'm just sharing my knowledge and my teaching techniques to introduce you to these different aircraft that we have. This one, the Dornier DOX is from Microsoft Flight Simulator. It's one it's called the Local Legend Number 12. Let's dig in. You can see here it's got a tugboat on it. You can activate the tugboat and steer it to your destination until you start your engines. It is a big aircraft. It's legendary. It's, as you can see here, from 1929. But this aircraft took a lot to turn it around in the water, so it's best to get a tugboat. <laughs> and it conveniently comes with one. Let's do a little bit more of a background and find out more about this airplane. Uh, many people have asked me, how do you fly this thing? Some of you are even asking, how do we start all those engines? But we'll go through all of that. We'll go through an automatic start, which is an easy way to get them all running. Uh, 12 engines, you guys. <clears throat> so uh, 12 motors with each 12 cylinders mounted in tandem. As you can see by this diagram here, you can see propellers at the back, propellers at the front. That's two separate engines. And uh, in this pusher and pull configuration, uh, yeah, that gives us our 12 engines, and it's the largest plane with the most amount of engines. Pretty amazing. These are actual shots that I took while I was flying it, and you can see this one here. I'm flying near Seattle, and uh, and then landing in the water right there in front of Seattle. So it's a flying boat designed by Dornier. Now, some will call it Dornier, whatever word works for you, um, in 1924, and saw its first flight in 29. Um, largest, heaviest, most powerful design for an airplane at the time. So when you look at unbelievable, it would take about 70 passengers most times. Although at one point they did intentionally break a record by carrying 169 passengers. Um, and that uh, was a record that they held for something like two decades. Um, but, uh, you know, 70 to 100, I guess a lot of people would say. Now, interestingly, it only flew about 1,600 feet above the water. And it was made to go from continent to continent. It was made for an ocean travel. And being a, a flying boat, it was okay. Even if it had troubles, it could put it down in the water. Um, the DOX had a range of 1,100 miles and cruised at a comfortable 110. Although I've been cruising around around 150, but I think it's in miles per hour. If I go back and look at the um, airspeed indicator. And uh, you can get it going pretty fast, but you can guess that the oil and gas consumption from these 12 engines back in 1929 would be quite uh, quite a bit. They'd be pretty thirsty, that's for sure. The, the crew consisted of 10 to 14 members just to manage the thing. Now, in Microsoft Simulator, the, the main plane doesn't have any liveries at all. And a matter of fact, in real life, only three were actually made. Um, they stopped. And as a, a lot of them do, I mean, this is the second legend that we are actually talking about here on YouTube and on Twitch. The first one was the Spruce Goose, of course, Howard Hughes uh, Spruce Goose, which made only one. <laughs> so how do they make history? Well, they successfully worked, and this thing did go around the world and take passengers all over the place who could afford it at the time, because it was certainly an expensive way to go. There is some YouTube live footage of it, of the real thing in action. Here are some of the cameramen that were taking the film back in the day. Let's go have a look at that right now. A nostalgic look at the past. Up in the sky over Lake Constance, the legendary DOX. In 1929, the world's largest seaplane. Length, 130 feet. Height, 33 feet. Wingspan, 156 feet. Overall weight, 125,000 pounds. Designed by Claude Dornier, former collaborator of Count Zeppelin. It was powered by 12 tandem design engines of 640 brake horsepower each. The DOX marked the start of large capacity air travel. On November the 5th, 1930, start of a worldwide flight across three continents. Technical specifications, let's have a quick look at that. Every one of these pictures you see are taken in Microsoft Flight Simulator in different stages of me flying it. And um, first flight, July 12th, 1929. 
passenger airliner type. And you can see some of the specifications in here. I'll just get down to the actual range. The range, 1,700 kilometers. Uh, ceiling was 10,000 feet. They rarely went there. Um, one of the pilots was quoted on film saying, why would we go up that high? It takes so much fuel to get there. <laughs> uh, cruising, as you heard, and then you heard the passenger. So actually, you've heard a lot of this stuff except for um, the power plant, 12 times 610 horsepower Curtis V1570. Now, apparently, at one point, it was fitted with radial engines, but this is the configuration that they ended up flying around with. We'll talk more about that in a second. I just want to get to the, the stuff that some of you will find dry, some of you will scrub ahead to, I want to go see it fly, and that'll certainly happen. Uh, I just want to mention here, this is the best way to set it up. I've tried a lot of configurations here, getting ready for this lesson and getting ready to show it on Twitch. Um, what I found was a single throttle for all 12. Simple as that. Microsoft Flight Simulator can't do 12 engines. It can only do four. So you could try to split that into two throttle handles like they do in the real plane. The real Dornier uh, DOX had one throttle lever for the left six and one throttle lever for the right six. And we'll see that when we go look at the cockpit uh, orientation. But simply enough here, we map one to the all, just, just throttle axis, and that actually covers all 12. And then we map one of your red mixture levers to the mixture axis. This is optional. You can go in and turn off all the taps. They are actually taps for mixture on all 12 engines. <laughs> you can do that with your mouse. Uh, I find it's just easier to use the red lever, and that'll connect to all 12 taps. And that'll be a lot easier for you, too. So I do I recommend you put in the mixture. Here's what the engine looks like, you guys. This is one sitting in um, Smithsonian, I think it is. That's what the, the V1570 Conqueror looks like. It's a V12 engine, 651 horsepower, designed in 1924. Open-ended cylinder liners, pressurized liquid cooling to keep it cool. Supercharger, a V configuration, and used on numerous airplane types in the day. Now take two of these and mount them inside the same nacelle and put a propeller on the front on this spindle you see here, and then put a propeller on the back on the other engine facing out the other way. Wild, isn't it? You can see a bit of a, a, a faded picture of here of what that looks like. Pretty cool. So weight and balance in here. The interesting part is, you know, all of the, all of the uh, passengers that you see here, forward baggage, rear baggage, economy cabin, 2,100 pounds of economy cabin, um, rear economy cabin, flight engineer, navigator, all the rest of the those that are on board. There is a lot in here. This is uh, quite impressive. Total takeoff weight, we're, we're taking off at 92,000 for all my tests, um, but it could be as high as 105,000. There's a lot of fuel on board, even at 50% fuel. That's a ton of fuel. All right, so learning a new airplane. Now, a lot of you have been through this kind of series with me before. Uh, whether it be the DC-3 or the, the Beaver, the DHC Beaver. Um, each of those lessons are exactly the same. I use the seven steps to learn the new airplane. And in here, you'll learn some of the idiosyncrasies of this specific kind of plane back in the day. Um, I've grayed out number five here, learn about the blue knob. There's no such thing in this airplane, so we don't have to worry about that. But in, in a lot of airplanes, we do. So here, it's pretty simple. Now, there is no pilot's operating handbook. There is a manual that comes with the plane. Um, if you're on a PC, it's in the official folder. You'll find it in there because it's a marketplace item. Or um, if you're on Xbox and you can't get at the file system, of course, there is a, a link I'll show you to go get the manual so that you can have it. But learning the vital speeds, learn how to handle multiple engines. In this case, that's a big thing, isn't it? Get or make a checklist. Cockpit orientation, where is everything? And then take it for a spin. And that's the idea behind it. So the manual is so well written with easy to follow explanations, lots of pictures. We don't need to source any other documents. This is not a POH. It doesn't have all the categories of POH, but it is complete and it works. So I didn't have to go find one somewhere. You know, with only three planes in existence, there isn't exactly a bunch of documentation flying around. So scan this and you'll be able to go pick it up from flightsimulator.com slash aircraft manuals. And you can see here, if you do have access to a PC, here's where you would find it. Wherever your community folder is, go up one, which should be FS data, and then down one into official, and you'll find it in the appropriate 
Microsoft Aircraft Garnier DOX folder. So we'll use flight. Uh, we'll use the flight manual for this lesson. And there is also there is a startup procedure here that we can also look at. Um, this was made by someone else, and I'll give you credit for that once we get into it. We're going to go show you this this uh, manual in a minute. But the manual that comes with it, there's a flight manual, and there's also a flight manual communication system. Two documents, which you would have seen on the previous page right here. There's the manual, and there's the radio manual. So it's the both of them, all right? Radios work. They really do. All right, so let's learn about the V speeds. Now, takeoff, landing, cruise, all of those speeds. Um, takeoff speed in the manual, as in real life, it didn't actually give us an airspeed to rotate. <laughs> It just simply said takeoff speed anywhere from 25 to 67 seconds. So you go barreling down the waterway and around 25 seconds, you start giving back pressure and eventually it'll come off the water. Isn't that amazing? Uh, kind of bizarre. But um, I found in my tests that uh, rotate around 150 kilometers an hour. That's what it's measured. As you can see here, that's what it's measured on your airspeed indicator. I put some a yellow one here for takeoff speed VR. So VR at 150, I put in cruise at 175. It's not much of a big difference there, is there? And then um, the VNE in red way up here, all right? And I have cruised around this area up here because we're not paying for gas, right? So there's some of the other ones in here, the range, the wingspan, the fuel capacity. Oh my gosh, 6,300 gallons. It's a lot of gallons. All right, learning a new airplane, get or make a checklist. If you scan this, this is the checklist that um, Jonathan Beckett made. I thought it was excellent. I was starting to write this myself when I was told to, hey, did you know that there's this one from Jonathan? And I looked over at that and said, why would I rewrite it? And I was doing the same thing. I was putting in control one is the, the electrical power station to turn that on. Control four. I was doing the same exact thing as I did trial and error. I wish I'd found this checklist before now. So uh, we're sharing it with you guys. Go and buy him a coffee, as we say, when you find resources like this that people have spent time for. All right, this is excellent because it gets you control one, control two, control three are all the different views on your keyboard. If you don't have a keyboard on your Xbox, you should go get one. They're about $7. And, uh, you know, a keyboard is going to be so handy for a lot of shortcuts that you might want to do. All right, so the control key plus the number keys for your different views. Control one is the master switch. Down is on. This is interesting, isn't it? Control two is the switch panel here. Down is on on these switch panels. And there's also a horn on there. I think the upper right one is a horn. Control three, the navigator area. Control four, generator and fuel valves. And we see down here the engine room itself. And you'll just play with the other views to get closer in. I mentioned to you before about... Um, one lever for all the throttles. Well, this wheel you see here controls six of the engines on the starboard side. This wheel controls six of the engines on the port side. Amazing, isn't it? And so um, you would just tell the engineer to cut all the engines. He would just crank it this way, and that would take the throttles down to zero. Uh, these are the mixtures down here. As you turn those, you can turn off individual fuel, fuel shut off, right, to each engine. Or you can just map it to your red lever, right? So here's the pilot, co-pilot, typical view. You can slide over and do the co-pilot view if you want. Pilot sits here, looks like a boat. It, it travels on the water like a boat. <laughs> it just happens to have wings, <laughs> but it really does look like an old tugboat, doesn't it? They just took the same thing from those days and said, let's put wings on it. That is an antenna up front, and in real life, there, were, there was somebody down below moving that until the operator said, that's a good signal. Well, honestly, that's the way it is. Um, this here can measure the wind, and it has a little dial on it. Even when you're at rest, it'll, at rest, it'll measure the wind. And then your normal, uh, um, I say normal six-pack and then attitude indicators. We'll look a little closer at that. The clock's up here. And these windows open. Now, the pilot seat, this nice cushiony seat, why not? Because all the passengers are living in luxury, too. <laughs> give, give this guy a cushion. The throttles on the left here, you can see there's the left one for the left three, a six, left six. <laughs> well, did I say three? The left six engines, the right six engines right there. And uh, we saw a glimpse of the engine room. We'll go back and take a look at that. Water steering is a separate wheel. Elevator trim is this wheel. So for that reason, some people jump out of uh, and go into um, 
They just heads down into the cockpit and crank it and look up and see how, how much they're turning. Yowzer. Cut all electrics over here with this red switch right here. Your tachometers are right there. Easy enough. The engine controls, as I mentioned. Now, here I've labeled it throttles for this set of levers. Clutch levers for this set of levers. Ignition under here, we'll show you how to use that for each of the engines. This is only looking at six engines at a time. Um, engine selector, one, two, three, four, five, six. And we only have six in front of us, the other six are behind us. And then compressed air, which is like a lot of people call bleed air, which is used to uh, get the engine, help get the engine rolling. So here we see step number six already, you guys. And so step number six, we're going to take a look at cockpit orientation. And this is where we get familiar with the airplane. You can see over here on the left side of the, of the pilot, we have uh, two levers. I mentioned them earlier in a bigger picture uh, when we were zoomed out. But those are the two levers to control the all of the engines. I can see how they could easily use these for taxing also, right? Turning up or down one side of the plane or the other. I like to do that with two engines with two levers. But we can't do that here. Cabin lights are here. Tachometers are here. Now, this is the mean RPM for all six engines on the right. Mean RPM for all six engines on the left. And these lights will indicate what state they're in, whether they're good, bad, or ugly. Up here is something that we'll look at a little closer. This is called the LOTC, and this is how you control the tugboat, kind of cool, or the line that you tie off. All right, the navigation station. Let's look at stations first, and then a few more details. They actually write it altimeter, all right? That's how it's written right on it. This altimeter device is for the navigator. There's also a timepiece over here with a lot of precision time on it for the navigator. Compass is here, and you can actually turn that dial if you wish. Not sure if any of these buttons actually work or if they do something. Maybe they lock the door. I don't know. Um, in here, the cockpit orientation. Here's the radio panel. We're moving over to that panel. These are different views. You'll find them as you go along. Uh, a perfectly working ADF right here. Uh, perfectly working um, VORs. Nav 1 and Nav 2. So we've got lots of navigation. We also have COM 1, COM 2, which is right here in these two. We have everything. <laughs> we can't do an ILS with it. I haven't seen any way to do that. There's only one needle, but uh, the rest of it works. Generators and fuel valves. The first two are generator. The second two are backup. Down is on. This will freeze them. So no more shooting, no more anything while we do something on deck. These are all fuel valves. You just click them all down. The ones in the middle, just leave those alone. Those are already down and they're already on. The instruments will focus on the main instruments needed for flight. Obviously, the airspeed indicator, the altimeter, the steering compass, the navigation, the TNB, and the VSI, and optionally the compass. Now on the left, or sorry, the left dials for the, the six engines on the left and the right ones for the six on the right. And then we get to the part where here's what the cabin looks like, everybody. I mean, can you imagine? Today we get on an airliner and we're packed in like sardines and we can hardly move. Look at the luxury and look at the china on the table. <laughs> you know, the pilot of this plane has to take it easy <laughs> or they could end up losing all that china. It was pretty neat. So the flowered wallpaper, I guess that's a sign of luxury back in the day. I don't know. But uh, this is what they had to live with. Look, carpeted floors, pretty amazing stuff. Multiple bulkheads, and away they go. Here's where, uh, you know, here's cabin seating, you guys. Wicker chairs. <laughs> That's it. Um, the hatches and the doors. Yeah, so here you see a couple of doors are open. There's a door at the back that's open, too. Here's one here at the back. Here's uh, one going straight through to both sides of these winglets. Those winglets actually help it fly also, but uh, they're great for flotation and stability and all the rest of it. So that's a beautiful thing. Um, there's plenty of other hatches, too, all over the plane, and you just turn those on and off with switches. Here you see the front hatch open here. Look at this. Fuel tanks below deck. Wow. Luxury above, fuel below. Luxury above, fuel below. Storage in the front. The kitchens, multiple kitchens with everything you could ever ask for. It's an amazing aircraft, and back in the day, it was a very expensive one to, to take for a, a flight. But, you know, how else could you get from continent to continent? Pretty cool. 
spawn on a water runway to get flying right away practice takeoff and landings so this is where you're going to figure it out right practice checklist for all phases and in some cases you might have to spawn on the land and then slew to the water because it has no other way of going across the land so demonstration of flying we're going to do a demonstration just show you the thing flying see what it looks like get a feel for the sound get a feel for what it looks like and uh, then hopefully you'll go and continue on from there Relived the era of a flying boat with the most powerful airplane built during the time. The Dornier DOX. All right, the first thing we want to do is cut the engines. Here's how we start. As soon as you say fly, it's already moving. You can see here, it's not moving fast. They're all on idle, but you will eventually go to the shore. All right, now we'll just give you an idea where we are here. Well, let's first cut the engines, everybody. I'm going to take my mixture. Let's go here. Control six, maybe control seven. All right, control seven, you can see here. I'm going to use my mixture control, which is already mapped to all of them. Take a look at these little red taps right here. As I pull the mixture back, they all move left and right, all 12, until it cuts off the engines. There we go. And we've got all engines cut off. And now we won't drift to shore. So where I've started here, just to give you an idea of where we are, we're sitting here at the Kenmore Air Harbor Seaplane Base. S as in Sam, 60. So it's Sierra 60 is the airport. And this is in Washington State, not far from Renton. Down here is Renton Airport, very famous. And right here is Redmond, Microsoft headquarters. That's where we are. And not far from us, just north of us, you'll see there's Payne Field, famous also. And so here's where we are in the water, which is a water runway right here. You can see how far I've gone just by talking about cutting the engines. And now I've cut the engines. Now, if there's any wind, it will it will drift you also. So you got to put the anchor in. So that'll be the next thing we do. This is a water runway right here. And from here, I actually do have enough room to take off. But I'm probably going to just show you the tugboat turn around and take off where I've got lots of room on a diagonal like this out here. All right, that's probably the plan. So let's get the tugboat going first. We've got everything else turned off. And to do that, we'll go back to our normal view. Get used to the, the control switches. Here's control, well, that's the default. Here's control one. That switch is on, which is down. Control two. And these switches are already on. This one up here is the horn. Absolutely wonderful. Love it. And number three is the navigator area. Believe it or not, your heading bug will actually activate this little red pointer right here. Put that where you want it. I'm using my Bravo for that. And you can see up here, there's also the altimeter. If you want, you can just use the standard B to get that um, set to the current. And this is a clock over here, uh, a very nice clock. Uh, number four is the uh, generators and the backup generators. We can turn those on also. And these switches here, you can see that some are in the up position and some are in the down. We really just want to make sure this switch right here is to the right. All right, that's your power switch. There would be off, on. All right, we've got that on. Let's go to the next. Control 5. Now we get to see all of the instruments. The reason they give us this Control 5 view is while the engines are running, you might want to be looking at specific engines. All right, the temperatures, the pressures, all the rest of it. And that's what these are for. Now if you go to Control 6, it shows you more of the controls themselves. This is actually all the throttles of all six engines on one side behind me is the other six if i move my throttle lever right now there's full and there's idle and you can see that the engineer who would be here and there's a full-time job here for an engineer they can just use this wheel to turn all of the engines of this of one side this is actually the port side 
And if you look at control seven, that shows you the uh, outside view of both. And quite honestly, look how close they are set with air behind. So my guess is, and we don't know, it's 1929 back then, but my guess is they stood here and they started at one end, I'd say the wheel end, where you've got engine number one and engine number 12. That means that both wings have an engine starting from probably the outside in, or more importantly, probably from the inside out. So maybe they start down at this end, engine number six, which is inboard right close to the fuselage, and engine number seven, which is also inboard to the fuselage, start both of those at the same time. It's probably the way they did it. I'm just guessing, but look how close a distance there is. You could turn and do either one. Now we're going to go through a manual setup. Uh, I'll have a separate clip uh, of an automatic startup. The automatic startup is right here. This one here will start all of them. And it'll do them one at a time, but it'll do it automatically. That's the fastest way right there. But what we're going to do is show you how to do at least one or two. We're not going to go through all 12 in this video, but you'll get the idea. It's just rinse and repeat after that. All right, so that's what we'll do. Let's just go to any other views here. Number eight, again, is looking at the stuff the same as we saw in number six. There's six, there's eight. So you're just looking back and forth between the two. Whoops, six and eight. Yeah, there we go. Number nine, we're looking over here. Looks like the same as another one. And number, oops, number nine, back to here and zero. That's kind of strange, nine here. All right, let me just hit my reset button here. Zero, nine, nine again. Okay, there's something strange there. But anyway, that's the normal view. Looking left, looking right, looking in, out. If you're on the outside, the normal views, looking down, looking left, looking right. There's looking right at it. Nice. Okay, back inside, we're ready to go. Now, we want to tug it first. So what we're going to do is come down here remove this steering wheel for the moment or the yoke or whatever you want to call it. It looks like a steering wheel back in the day. And we're going to get at this box that you see here that you heard about in the presentation right there, the lot C. Now, if you hover on it, it does tell you what it's for, anchor, tugboat, control. All right, the first thing I want to mention is about this anchor. So let me just set up the outside view, the outside view so that we can see the anchor. Let's come down here. And let's just get that right in there. We want to see the anchor drop. It's so cool. Yeah, that's close enough. We'll still see it from this angle. All right, back inside. I'm going to let the anchor drop and then, jo and then go outside. This red light will come on. So anchor drop right now. And there it is dropping into the water. That was pretty fast. Let's bring it back up again. And up it comes. Pretty cool. I like that. Little added touches like that are really nice. Now, to start the engine, we're going to drop the anchor, but for now, I want to use the tow boat to pull us around first. So this is the tow boat. I'm going to leave the anchor up, and I'm going to summon the boat. So let's just summon it with the left button, and you ask it to leave with the right button. Simple as that. And once it's connected, we will control it with this knob. All right, here we go. Let's summon it. Boom. And three more, two more, one more. And here it comes. All right. Coming in from the side, going to pick up uh, a rope from the guys and uh, and then make it taut, ready to tow us where we want to be towed. We're going to turn it around 180 degrees. I have tried taxiing you guys. You could try to taxi with some engines on on the left and then try to turn right. Your rudder wheel can do the taxiing. So before we get started any further, this rudder, sorry, this wheel right here is actually for taxiing, which isn't mapped to anything. It's not mapped to your rudder pedals. I mentioned this probably in the presentation, but it's been a day since I talked about it. So there's our rudder. Nice sound. And, um, but this is actually what controls it in the water, the water rudder. So this would go back or forth to turn us. And you could certainly do that under power. 
and this is a pretty tight space that I'm in. I'm going to use the tug and also it's just fun to use it. So here we go. The tug is connected. Looking back outside again like that. And what I'm going to do is just turn it around and say, hey, it looks like I got more room to my left. So I'm going to take it to the left. So here's the control to turn it up. So we're going to speed it up. Somehow it's not doing it right. It's kind of slow. Okay, and let's go back outside. Here, are we moving? Who knows? Probably, but it's probably very slow. Hold on. Let's get a look here. And the best way to look at this is to look at it against the tree, sort of like that. I would say we're not moving. We're just kind of floating. We do have a tug, right, still? for some reason. Yeah, there it is. Okay, let's see what's happening. Tugboat speed. I'll try the other way. I would think turning it to the right. I have done this many times. Why isn't it working? So, I'm using my mouse. What if I just click it and give it a direction? going to go to the left. This is crazy. This is really hard to do. To the left. And I hope I have some speed. There we go. It's working. And we'll get a bigger view like this. It's turning it around nice and slow. And in fact, if you zoom in, And you do this, do it even sharper. She's really moving. So you'll really want to keep track of what you're doing. There's the shoreline. Back there is the seaplane base. And over that way is where I just want to head out into that open water. That'd be the easiest way, safest way. It's really cranking it around, isn't it? Okay. I think I'm going to stop it soon. Let's come back to here, and you can easily stop at any time by simply going boom. And I'll just take this back. You can see the tug leaving out that one window, and it should be leaving out that to the right there. And just sitting off to the nearby just in case we need it. So that'll work. As I get rolling, I better do it a little bit more to the left, and uh, I'll get some air going and just sort of head it out that direction. All right, we're ready to get rolling, so we're going to drop the anchor. This this has to be a little bit easier to use. I had troubles. I think at one point I went up like this, went down, like turned with my right mouse, just so I can get more control of this and move it around. But that seems like a very slow control there. Not having much luck with it. This was your left and right where you want to go. All right, put the anchor in so I don't drift any further. Looking around, making sure the anchor's in because once you start the engines, look out. And the anchor is down in the water right there. Okay, ready to roll. So we're gonna go to the engine room. Number six, control six. Now let me just explain how this works, you guys. You know already the throttles are there. You already know that your mixture controls all those taps. There's all the taps. So the taps have to be in the rich position all the way up, just like in any other airplane. Full forward gives us rich. I'll give you a closer view of that. There we go. There's throttle. And here's mixture. All right, full forward and bring our throttles up just a little. And there we're set, just like in any other plane, um, full rich and a little bit of throttle, or as they say, cracked a quarter inch. Let's go to this view first. And what I want to do is um, start one of the engines first. So you remember that where these needles are, we start with uh, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. That's the right side. And then when you look over on the other side, there is a, a setting for this too, which is, if you remember, it's control eight, sorry, six, seven, eight, nine. All right, so, so six and nine, six, nine. They seem to be the same, okay. 
So it's get a little confusing, but anyway, this will be seven, eight, nine, ten. So I'm actually going to start seven, which is very close to the fuselage, and six, which is very close to the fuselage on the port side. Now, when you're starting these, the idea is to clutch on, clutch on, and you could do all of them, all right? And that means they're engaged. Just click them. All right, now you could just leave them like that. It doesn't hurt anything to leave them all on. Same with the ignition, all right? This is ignition timing adjustment. Now we only have a choice of on or off, but you can see there is a variable there, but we have on or off. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna come in here real close. Let me just see if I can do this. Get in really close and come down a bit. Let's do it that way. All right, so now over here, this is the, the lock for it. Right now you can't move it anywhere. So I'm just going to click the lock, and then now I can turn it. Click, and all I can do is click, click. I can't do anything variable in between. I'm ready to start this engine, all right? And I'll turn off my head tracker. It's kind of jumping around here. There we go. Now I'm also going to select engine number one. There's one, there's two, and there's three. There's four, there's five, and there's six. All right, so that's what we're going to do engine number one, we're going to turn on the compressed air. We're done. Now, over here, ignition. All right, now if you take a look at, there's the off position. I'm just gonna use my Bravo for this, but you can do it one at a time. Um, if I use the Bravo for this, then it turns all of them on. There's both. I'm on both or left or right. They didn't have a left right back then. So that's just using the Bravo. But you want to only start one at a time in this case. So you'd want to go to each of the engines in here. All right. So you can just go to one magneto of each of the six. All right. That's how you could do it. So let me just, because we've got this set for engine number one, we can get away with another automatic thing and just leave it on all of them. So all mag magnetos are on. This is the only ignition on. Everything else is clutched and our throttles are ready to go. So we're ready to start number one. Now what we could do is get number six ready, or sorry, number seven ready over here. Just bear with me. So we can, I think, use number nine. That's the one we just did. Number five, four, no. We cannot get the other bank. Maybe here. I think that's the one we just did. There we go, I got it, but it's kind of close. And what I want to do is set this one up right here. So I'm gonna clutch it, unlock it, click it, and the magnetos are already on for all of them. All right, and now I want to start, all right? So I'm gonna start, oops, sorry, compressed air, and set it for first one. Let's just have a quick look at this. We wanna make sure this is right. Seven. Yep. So we've got seven and one. When you think about looking at the airplane, we look on the outside here. Seven and one. Um, one is here. Seven is here. So I did it wrong. What we want is one, two, three, four, five or six, maybe six and eight or six and seven. You know, the two inboards, then the next two, then the next two, all the way out to the outside edge. All right, so let's rethink this just to make sure we've got it right. So we want to start these two engines. We might as well start two at a time, two at a time. So we're going to start the inboard two clusters first. So this is actually five, six, and it's actually seven, eight. Five, six, seven, eight. All right, let's focus on that. Then we'll go out from there. All right, so on this panel here, if we look closely, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six. So what we can do is turn this one so we get six, looks like we have to be really, oops, that is on six. Okay, we're good. Yeah, the views here, I can see they'll have to fix the views or someone will come up with a better camera views, but there's number six. The uh, nebulizer, the vaporizer is on, compressed air is on. And let's make sure, one, two, three, four, five, six, we're gonna do, we're gonna do six and uh, one, one, two, three, four, five, and six. We're going to do five and six, so we're going to do six and five at the same time, right? So that's easy enough. We're going to do 
five click wow from this view it just doesn't work five six there we got those two all magnetos are on that's good it's just the ones that we have turned on for here will work we've got both clutches in so five and six should come on the same time all right um, first well actually we got to do six and then once it starts we'll go to five okay good enough here we go so there's six started we're going to come back here to five and do the same thing You saw the needle jump up there, actually. Let's see how that looks. We've got two running right there. Now we want to go over to seven and eight. So we got to come over to the other panel. Let's see if we can do this somehow. That's not the other panel. That's the normal panel. I want to get over to the other panel. We just can't get there from here. Okay. Out we go. You can see this can be a tedious exercise, so we'll do it once, and that's it. <laughs> now we want to do 7 and 8, so 7 and 8. If you look down here, you'll notice 7 and 8, right, with the same lever. Now, you could probably set both of these and do opposite ones also, but we'll do 7 first. And if we line that up, we'll see it probably lines up. We'll do like this, boom. That's supposed to be a seven. I guess if we line it up, it looks like a seven. There we go. The uh, vaporizer's on, compressed air is on, and we have seven and eight on, and ignition for both. So we're ready, and same thing again. There we go for seven. We can go out and check, but you can also look at the meters up above. And we move this over to 8, and we do the same thing. So we've got everything set for it. And I'm letting go. All right, so there's our inboards done. They'll quiet down here as they get going. They started out with a puff of smoke. We just weren't out here fast enough to look at it. Um, you could do the rest in any order you want, but I'm trying to keep it balanced so passengers don't feel the yaw to the left and now a yaw to the right and now a lot. So I'm trying to keep it like that. Now, normally they would throw anchors in the back and the front, but let's do it this way. All right, from here on, you can certainly do as many as you want. Um, we could speed it up, but let's just, for the rest of them, one, two, three. Oh, we'll just come back up here. One, two, three. Come back down here, and now we will go through the others. We did seven and eight. Hold it, make sure it starts. And then finally three, and I'll go outside quickly so we can see the smoke come off the thing. Look at that. We manually did it. Now it's already moving. I thought I had an anchor on. I'm already starting to move you guys. E boy. Looks like I'm still facing back the way I was. Yep, I am. I was sure I got tugged around, but you know, that's how it goes. So this is a runway. I should be able to take off. But you know, you don't take guesses like that in real life. But we've got everything running. We're good. And now you could go look at all of these things. Look, we got generator troubles by the looks of it. <laughs> all right, back in. How does our RPMs look? I'll give you guys an idea what the taxiing is like. We're probably going to have trouble with that sailboat over there, but we'll take a, a guess. No, there's enough room there. I can take off. But the taxiing part, you can try it. But it's that big wheel right there, and you can turn left and right. As you get moving, I'm going to give it full power. We 
we start to speed up? Pull back just to make sure you don't have too much purposing going on. Speed's coming up. We're at 130, 140. I'm going to turn a bit. Now I have some air rudder. So the air rudder is working a little. There we go. Wow, what a sound. Coming up to 150. It should be pulling off the water any minute now. Let's just turn it to the side. And it should come off. Lift off. That's nice and smooth now. Here we go. 37 seconds have passed. And up she comes. Lift off. And none too soon. So you wouldn't normally take off toward a seaplane base like that. Always take off away from it. Unless you know you got lots of room and you could turn quickly if you had to. Lift off. All right, we're sailing. Climbing out. There it is behind us. Lift there off. are no flaps. There's nothing like that. That was quite a distance, really. Okay, I'm going to turn that down a bit. It's in my ears really loud. I'm not sure about you guys. But once we're rolling, we don't need it as loud. All right. So from here, it's really just monitoring instruments, you guys. I'm just going to level off. I don't need to go too high here. Using my normal trim wheel. Let's see if we get a better view here. We're traveling at 165. We're still climbing. And um, we're about uh, one, two, three, four hundred meters above the ground. And we're heading, looks like we're heading north. Okay, we're going to go, there's the mountains. We're going to head south. Away we go. And I'm going to stop climbing, so I'm just going to use my trim wheel to get that nose down. Sorry, every time I turn my head, it wrecks the, uh, look at that bank. Isn't that beautiful? Now we're heading the opposite direction. I do see some traffic. And we're heading down towards Seattle. Actually, there's Seattle over there. Sure, let's go to Seattle. Things are running fine. I'm gonna just trim it down because we don't need to go too high. Remember, in real life, they didn't go higher than 1600 in most trips across the ocean. All right, showing a negative on there. Speed is increasing. I can pull back some power now. I'm gonna take it back to about there. They're all drinking just fine. That would work. And let's have a look. 170. It's going to pick up a little bit because I would drop the nose now. Here we go. 175. That's a nice cruise. I'm heading straight for Seattle. We'll go, we'll go park it at Seattle. Or we could go straight down to Renton, which is down here too. Now, let's get some fresh air. Okay, that's better. In fact, in real life, these ones at the front opened up out, outward. Yeah, that's right. There we go. Beautiful. I would bet at this speed that's not very healthy for them, but we're doing it. Probably you do that once you're taxiing so that you got some fresh air. All right, so now we're in cruise. I want to do a couple of tests just to show you, you know, the power off thing. Hold on a second while I turn down something here. There we go. Now I can hear myself. My headphones were too loud. What a beautiful sight. Well, we're actually descending, so let's go back to my head tracker here. Yeah, we're descending a little. Let me just pull that up a little. And we're heading toward the Seattle open water area. But, you know, one of the things we can test you guys is, you know, the, the, the power off stall thing. So first thing I'll do here, you should get a lot more height for this and you should make sure you're over in an area where there's no people. But when you're doing tests like this, you can just simply pull back the power, hold your altitude. If you take a look down here, my altitude is 
like three, four, five, six hundred meters. Try to hold that altitude and just see when the wing drops. All right, so this is what we're doing. We're pulling back on the yoke. My yoke is almost back to my chest and there it fell off a wing. Give it some power, nose down, left rudder, and we're back out again. And that happened very quickly. I didn't get a chance to look at the um, speedometer, the speedometer at the airspeed indicator. But boy, it dropped off really quick. But you know, one thing you can also test is the um, the stall speed at power on. So here we are with power on. I'm just going to go up and up and up and up until it just won't. So there, I'm going to hold it there. What are we at? Still around 600 meters. Hold it there. Keep holding it. Pulling the yoke back further. I'm trying to hold my altitude. Now we're at 500 meters, so I'm not pulling back hard enough. Yoke is almost to my chest, and there about 110. It dropped off, kind of mushed in. So that's a good thing to know. Um, power on stalls are good to know when you're taking off. That's when you have full power. Power off stalls are good for when you're landing. So these are good things to know about when not to to go below a certain speed. I'm going to suggest we don't go below 110. All right, we should be landing around 110, no lower. All right, let's try that out. So here it's easy enough to trim up, trim up, trim down. It's easy enough to trim just uh, using the wheel. I'm actually using what's built in here. Let me come back. Hard to see it down here. Yeah, okay. Let's do it this way then. This is your trim wheel, and I've got it connected to my Bravo trim wheel. Doesn't show it turning, but it actually is working. And um, you can tell right here, I'm going to trim down. And there it's the nose is heading down. Now I'm going to trim up. The nose is heading up. So that, that works, even if it's not turning inside there. And let me see, I had full power now. I'm going to pull it back again to around 2,000 RPM. Take it easy on the gas. Maybe about there. Get a nice cruise in at about 165, and I'll pull that back later. 160, 170, we're at 175. Because we're descending, let me just trim it. We should settle in around 160 there. I'll take it to 1800, let's see what that looks like. Hello, Seattle, over that way. Yeah, let's follow the coast. Right over this marina. Nose is dropping. I'm going to trim it now because I got a new RPM setting. And let's see, there's my 165 I'm hoping for. 150, one, yeah, it's still 170. All right, as we fly over Greenwood and Ballard and heading toward the Pacific Ocean, this river right here goes all the way into. Um, Renton, which is over that away. That'd be a good place to land too, but you know, we don't have wheels, so harder to get up on land. <laughs> Let's just head over to Seattle, over that away, and we'll land there and finish up the demo. As you can see, it's not that hard to do, but one thing you might want to try is you land and then take off again and see how it goes. All right, I just took off from Seattle, back there. And uh, now we're gonna go to check out some nav equipment. I wanna get high enough so that I can play around in the navigation room, uh, radio room, and uh, not worry about crashing. So <laughs> there is no autopilot on this plane, so we'd have to be careful. Um, I'm gonna experiment with the uh, my Twitch community. We're gonna have two of us with your controls and have one of us back there messing around with the radios all right so let's do that it's pretty steady it's climbing some more i'm just gonna bring the nose down a little and we'll see if we can do something with the radios now okay so radio room let's go find it and i can't get there from here Damn, did it. Boy, it took a lot. That's a whole lot of different views. So you want to set up a separate view for that. What I'm trying to do here, everybody, I'm going to lock that in like that. I'm going to just go quickly to here, see how I'm doing. 
I'm at 3,000 feet. I'm losing a little bit, but that's fine. I'm turning a bit to the right, that's fine. So what I want to do is I just want to pick up a VOR and show you how that works. There is a VOR right here at Payne Field. And that VOR, if you look at it, it's 110.60. 110.6. Let's try that. All right, so this is the view. This is nav one here. It's actually set for 110. I don't want to stay here too long because the plane could start tilting and whatever. It is turning to the right. So 110.5, so I want to make it 0.6. There we go, that's 6, 110.6. And immediately this needle right here, it's a good demonstration. This needle right here is pointing to the right. And if we look a little closer at that, we got a nav 2, we got comms 2. We can see that it's, it's, it is turning, where plane is turning. We're actually turning toward it already. <laughs> So here we see, we would tell the uh, pilot with the intercom, we would say, turn right uh, two zero degrees, uh, bearing two zero. And we're, gonna, we're just doing it automatically. And then we'll just center that up. Now, if we look inside the cockpit now, back to here, I thought maybe it would show a deflection on here. All right, you, you could even tell them what exact heading to go to, but this is how we would get there. And it's pretty much where we're pointed now. Up to that chunk of land is where the actual pain field is. I'm gonna level the plane here. Go back to the radio room. I think I could do that. Maybe that. There we go, left button. So let me go back to normal cockpit view. I went back one with the hat switch and left one. All right, and now I see that it's a bit to the left. All right, now I thought it would have an effect on this right here. So I don't know if we can adjust that. That doesn't seem to be an adjustment. So it doesn't seem that there's an indicator here, but there should be right there. And the idea is that we would follow this course and listen to the radio operator and just get to Payne Field. Now, if you take a look on the map now, we can cheat, we can look here. And I'll just have a look here. There it is. There's the VOR. We're heading right for it. If you take a look, and if you do a if you do a measurement from here, uh, whoops, measure distance from the VOR, we are approximately at 292 degrees magnetic, and I can't even tell. It's too small for me to read. Something like 12 nautical miles away straight up. So we should be able to go straight to that VOR using this instrument. Now, I'm surprised about this. I, maybe we get closer, that'll come into range. I'm not sure what that instrument is, but I thought maybe that would be our indicator. Okay, down one, over left. Yeah, we're pretty much on, on right on course right here. We could use another VOR and do triangulation. Sure, certainly we could do that. Here's your comm radios over here. If you wanted to tune those in, same idea. Back in the day, they had the bigger knob is for the outside. Let's say we wanted 118. There's 118, let's say 20. 20, 118, 20, right? And that's COM1, there's COM2. So we, those all work also. I've used all of those to tune things in. And now this is a this is a strength. This The person at the front would be turning the antenna and you would see this go up. There's the biggest strength. They would say, hold it right there. Much like people yelling out the window to say, the antenna's good there. Now, if you look really closely, we should be able to see a rotating beacon somewhere around here. And I'm just waiting for it, and I don't see it. But we're heading there anyway. We're sort of naturally turning toward it. We're way up high, so we're just going to overfly it. It's going to level it up there. So visual is always good. I mean, visual helps you see where you're going. But this is telling me I'm pretty much right on, just a little bit to the left, and I'll go over the VOR. Now we could wait and see. What I'll do is I'll just cut the video and go ahead real fast, or just fast forward it, and let you see that we're going to go straight over that VOR. That's the VOR right in the middle of the airport that's sitting on a building, you guys. Look at the lines of this baby. There's the water rudder right there. That little piece out the back is the water rudder, right with that smaller wheel that's beside the pilot. This is the step, as they say, right here. There, it looks like just like a boat, doesn't it, back in the day? And there's the step. That's where it would, uh, you want it up on the step first, so the water's only right here, and then there's less friction, and away you go. 
Kinda cool. I'm not gonna level this off now. We don't need to keep climbing. There we go. You notice no flaps. Oof. Yeah, we're heading to our destination just fine. Beautiful. Let's leave that view on. And we can tell over here. Away we go. We've kept a pretty steady course. Heading straight for Payne Field. We can't land there. We have no wheels. But uh, we can certainly land after it. This is an ADF up here, which works well, too. There's a Payne ADF, uh, a Payne NDB. Let's see, right here. There's a pain NDB right there, which is 396. It should give us pretty much the same indication. We're heading to here, and it's right there. So 396, let's give that a try on the ADF. Let's make sure that I'm still in level flight. Oops. Not in level flight. There's pain field. All right, I seem to be descending. So let's just pick that up. All right, 396. We'll go here, three, four, three, nine, six. The needle should turn, there we go. Now yeah, we're pretty much heading in the right direction, so that works also. And that's actually sitting, uh, let's see, that's right around here. So we should see a bearing off to the left, because that's where the that's where the NDB is, and here's where the VOR is. We should be one should the VOR should be pointing just off to the left of center, and this one's further left of center. Yep. So we will head to the VOR, and then we'll go straight up, and you should see this one straighten up. So the navigation's working fine. All right, so what I want to do, I want to come around and do some landing and takeoffs before I get to Seattle Harbor. I don't want to make a fool of myself in front of all those people. I'm just kidding. This is the West Point Lighthouse right here underneath us, for those who don't know. Right there. Is it there? Oh, there's something there, yeah. What a nice bird. Look at that. Beautiful. There's the top view. Look at the spear on the front. Left view. And in we go. There's Seattle Harbor right there. So I don't want to do it now on the open ocean. Lots of room. We want to slow it down and go in for landing. Take off again. Circle around. Come back to Seattle Harbor. I got the idle down to zero. And the RPM should drop accordingly. Yep. The RPMs are getting down. No lights are on. Nothing's wrong. We can see in here we've got 150 as we descend, and we're descending about 500 feet per minute to make it easy on all the passengers. Easy enough. What's our altitude? We're sitting at 1250, 250 heading to 200 meters, and uh, that's getting close. We're just landing in the open water, make sure there's nobody ahead of us. And this is how easy it is. I haven't done anything except pull back power. I didn't even trim just to see what it would do. Um, it's now, yeah, it's still 500, 600 feet per minute, which is acceptable. It's, it's gentle enough for, for passengers. Let's give it a shot. It's hard to tell when the water is, is calm. There will be ripples, but not till we get closer here. Don't be in a hurry to get down to the water, because once you hit it, you'll know it. We'll see ripples out here when we get close. And then we'll take off again, and then we'll come back in and land over at Seattle, because we'll know what to do then. What a view. Can you imagine looking out your window and seeing that? There we go. And I'm just pulling back a bit to flare as it bleeds off more speed flaring here might probably better to see it from the outside there's the angle flaring the back ends touching and we're down keep that keep the elevator back and let it just decelerate on its own there are no flaps there we go all right so from here we're just going to take off and then we're going to go and land over at seattle harbor that's not so hard is it full power 
go nice and gentle, full power. Keep that nose up. It's trying to plane now. Outside view. There's a better view. I'm gonna ease forward. And then back I go again. Should lift off right about now. Just like that. Now I'm easing off on the yoke. Here we go. Pulling up. Let's have a look here. It's over 150. I wasn't monitoring when we were taking off, but you could time it. You could say, okay, it's 37 seconds to 67 seconds, somewhere around there. So after 37 seconds, okay, now I'll start pulling back. Let it gain that speed while you're level on the water. Let it get up on the plane. All right, Seattle, here we come. Rock and roll. Do you notice I'm not even looking at the engine room? I'm not looking at anything because no lights are on and RPMs are working and parameters are as they say, you know, let's fly the plane first, we'll worry about the rest later. Hey there, boat. How you doing? Bet you never see one of these in the sky. All right, Seattle, here we come. When we reach this point right here up ahead, that point over there, uh, then, we'll, then we'll cut power and go in. That uh, antenna at the front, by the way, in real life they have, that round thing is the antenna. In real life they have someone down below in the front who actually turns it. It's a big steel wheel. They just turn that wheel until they get the right reception. And the radio operator says, that's good right there. It's almost like turning the antenna outside your house in the old days, if some of you remember that. Are we past the point yet? No. The point of no return. Condos along the water. All right, looks pretty close, doesn't it? All right, let's just pull back power. It's not as close as it looks on that view. Pulling back power, and let's just see what it does first. Speed is definitely dropping. Nose is dropping. VSI is going negative now. Let's see what it does. That 500, looks like it's climbing. I mean, sorry, it's going pretty fast. I'm gonna pull up the nose with my yoke. I want it to be around 500 again, like the last time. Pull it back. And let it stay around the 500 mark. So you can see what I was looking at, right? 500 there, 150 there, looking good. If I have to, I'll turn the last minute, but I'm gonna try to coast in and just kind of cozy up to that that ship right there. Now typically if the winds favor us we we should go lengthwise on the riverbank. That way we got lots of room for air. Let's see how this goes. If I have to, I'll do a turn when I get there. It's still pretty fast, isn't it? I'm gonna turn. A little fast coming in toward that boat. So I'm gonna just turn here. There's the water. And there we go. Straighten up. Got a bit of rudder in there. And that gives me more room. There we go, that looks gorgeous. And once we get slowed down, we will slow down. Once we slow down, we'll, we'll get that anchor in. And once that anchor drags, then we should be able to stay where we are. That was too abrupt. I should have coasted a bit more up toward that wharf, but that's okay. Welcome to Seattle. And uh, that's it. Let's go take a look now that we have time. Let's go take a look at the engine room and just see while we're anchored here, just see what the temperatures look like. I'll do a quick check on that because we didn't get a chance to do that while we're actually flying. And you shouldn't be messing around in here. Should have an extra person with you. Maximal tensure. Uh, so this red light would be the red light you get on the front panel to tell the, to tell the pilot what's happening. And you look at each of these, although I can't read German, but you can see that, well, this one's sitting here at the two. They don't show any green area. So I'd have to learn a little more, more about what these are, but the red light would certainly mean that we're in trouble. I noticed all the engines are sitting here. If I give it a little bit of power. Does anything, yeah, the middle dial. This dial moves up. This dial hasn't done anything yet. That could be temperature, who knows. But I don't I don't have any cowl flaps, so I, I can't control the temperature that way. 
Oh, there's temperature there. Mortar 3 is actually says temperature, yep. All right, that's it, you guys. I mean, I want to give you an idea of how to fly it. And uh, it's not that hard to fly. It's just a big, graceful, heavy bird. And you just have to keep that in mind when you go to when you go to fly this thing. You saw graceful turns come in gently on the water. With this much weight, it really does displace a lot of water, doesn't it? I thought I saw a Ferris wheel. Oh, right there, yeah. There it is. Yeah. All right, and then now I'm just going to use the mixture control to pull them all back. And all of them stop at the same time. That's the easiest way to do it. And all is quiet on the front. Just come back out one last time, make sure the anchor is in. It must be because it stopped pretty abruptly. There's the anchor sitting in. Perfect. Hope that's enjoyable, you guys. It certainly is for me. Flying something like this is a thing you'll never get to do in real life. And it's just nice that they brought that to us in Microsoft Flight Simulator. It's been a pleasure.